today's keynote presentation sponsored by St. Rita's Medical Center is titled Improv, Improve Your Testing, Tips and Tricks from Jester to Tester. Our presenter is Damian Sinodinos, testing practice lead and also does work state consulting. Uh, Damian started testing software on purpose and for money in 1993. Since then, he has helped build better software and build software <clears throat> better using various methods and tools in numerous roles at many companies in diverse industries. In addition, he is very active in his local community and speaks about testing and more at conferences worldwide. During the past 10 years, Damien has focused primarily on teaching and leading testers and improving processes. Today, he is testing practice lead at WorkState Consulting and currently working as a test lead at the world's authority in chemical information. Besides testing, Damien also enjoys improv, golf, poker, gaming, acting, a true renaissance man, I guess, <laughs> cartooning and spending time with his family. So with no more ado, I present Damien. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, how's everybody doing today? Good, can you hear me first of all? All right, so I don't know if you know this about uh, comics and comedy acts. Traditionally, 11.15 a.m. is the desired time slot for comedy. This is when the big laughs happen across the world. It's not the 10 o'clock blue show. It's 11.15 a.m. So I hope you're primed and ready to enjoy, learn, laugh. All right, Mike, all right? All right, so improve, improv your testing, tips and tricks from jester to tester. A couple things about this particular presentation. It was originally designed to be an hour and a half. Um, I've since added content for today. I've taken out some content uh, to try and make it fit in an hour. That said, I won't do that. I won't make it. I'm going to run out of time, but that's okay. Um, we're going to try and get through as much as I can. I'm going to talk fast just like this, so uh, strap yourselves in, arms and legs inside the vehicle. Um, uh, tips and tricks about jester to tester. So I am the aforementioned jester and tester. Who am I? I'm Damien Sinodinos. Here's a couple different ways that you can get a hold of me. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself so you know who is standing up on this stage. Um, as my bio said, I've been testing since 1993, but before that, I taught myself basic on a TRS-80 in the early 80s. So I've been around computers uh, my entire life, uh, very interested in them. Uh, in 19 1993, I dropped out of college and began working full-time at CompuServe in their quality assurance department. Uh, those were the glory days before AOL overtook them. Uh, in the last 23 years, I've been at 14 or 15 different companies in the same amount of industries in a lot of different roles, doing a lot of different jobs. I've been a manual tester, an automated tester, using tools to enhance my uh, testing capabilities. I've been a manager. Uh, I've focused on reporting and metrics. Um, I've done performance testing. I've worked at an airline. Uh, I've worked in retail. I've worked in education and insurance and banking. And the one common thing that all of these different industries and companies have in common is software. They all make software in some way, shape, or form, and therefore it needs to be tested. So that's how I kind of fit into these different uh, companies and industries. Um, I'm also very active in the local uh, testing community as well as the global testing community. I speak at testing conferences. Uh, but where I really, what I really enjoy doing is teaching testers through uh, training or mentoring one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so hopefully there's a little bit about my testing background, my testing credentials. Um, but what about the jester part? Uh, about eight or nine years ago, on a whim and a suggestion from a coworker, I took a class in improvisational comedy. Um, but again, before that, just like uh, my computer background, I've been a, stu a student of comedy my entire life. Uh, I've always analyzed comedy and skits and different shows to see what makes it funny, what makes people laugh. So this seemed like a natural progression for me. Uh, I trained for a year under two different teachers, one of them from Second City trained. At the end of that, our uh, graduation ceremony was a public performance. That's how you graduate. So uh, I joined and founded a group called uh, Parlor Tricks. We performed for a few years, did a lot of corporate gigs, a ton of bar prov. Uh, we did a lot of comedy clubs. Uh, I also joined a group after that that had more established name. Um, named uh, Fake Bacon. You can see that all improv troops have these zany names. Uh, so I've been performing for about eight or nine years. I've taken the last couple years off because I have two adorable little time sinks at home that uh, take up a lot of my time. And it's not the performances that I don't have time for, it's the practice. Improvisers are some of the most prepared people you'll ever meet. I just couldn't attend enough practices to, uh, to be fair to my team, so I had to drop out. But I still get to perform improv doing presentations like this as well as uh, side work for a company called Improv Edge that does corporate training and teaches business skills uh, wrapped up in an improv hook. So there's a little bit about me, uh, my testing credentials, my improv credentials. But 
that's who I am, we should probably answer some other questions. What are we doing here today? Today, I hope to present some novel and notable ways to think about testing. Now, how many people in here are testers? The main hat that you wear during the day is testing. All right, a handful of hands. How many people in here work with testers? Some way, shape, or form in your job? All right, more hands went up. There's a good chance, whether you're a tester, whether you work with a tester, or if you're not familiar with testing at all, some of the things I talk about are going to seem like common sense. It's only because they are. They're not new in any way, shape, or form. But I hope to present them in novel ways. And because I'm presenting them in a novel way, I hope that they'll be more notable, more memorable to you. Why are we here? Why is very important. The reason that we do things is terribly important. Today, I hope to help you improve your testing. Now, I just asked how many people here are testers. Hopefully, you'll get some value from this presentation and that you'll go back and have ways to do your testing job better. Some of you, however, are not testers. Many of you are not testers. So what value can this presentation possibly have for you? Here's three different things I think you can still uh, draw value from. The first is for those of you that work with testers. You may gain insight into how they think and the way they do their job. And how, hopefully getting insight into how your coworkers do their job may help you do your own job better. Another way, many of the topics and ideas that I present today, I correlate to testing, but they're not testing ideas. They're general ideas and concepts that can easily be correlated to developers or business analysts or other system administrators or plumbers or bakers or knitters. They're just very generic ideas that can apply to a lot of different people in a lot of different roles. So hopefully you can take some of these ideas and think how they might apply to you in your per personal situation and get value from that. And third, I hope it's fun. I hope that there's value in fun and I hope that this is a fun thing for you. So even if you're not a tester, I think that there's ways that you can get value from today's presentation. How do I intend to present these novel and notable ways to think about testing and hopefully help you improve your testing? By using improv as an analogy for testing. In my training, I think that using improv and metaphor as a way to teach and train people is very effective. Sometimes if you're having trouble understanding uh, uh, an idea in one context, it might be helpful to look at that same or similar principle in another context, and that might give you insight into the first content. So before I go any further, I want to talk about shallow agreement. There's a great quote by George Bernard Shaw that says, the, most, uh, the biggest enemy to communication is the illusion that it has occurred. Anybody heard that? It's generally what shallow agreement is. It's when people think that they're communicating. They're using words, and words are just containers for meaning. But they don't realize that the meaning wrapped up in their word is different than the meaning that somebody else has in the same word. So they believe that they're communicating with each other by using the words that they both seem to understand, and they walk away thinking they could have communicated when, in fact, they have not. I want to avoid that. So I'd like to define a couple of the words I'm going to say over and over and over today so that you know what I mean when I say those words. The first is testing. Now, if you go and look at different sources, different uh, dictionaries, ask different people across your company, across the globe, you're going to get a lot of different ideas about what testing is. Uh, there's two gentlemen named James Bach and Michael Bolton. They're part of the context-driven uh, school of testing. They also founded the Rapid Software Testing Methodology, a way to approach testing. And this is their working definition. They say that testing is the process of evaluating a product by learning about it through experimentation. And that includes, to some degree, questioning, studying, modeling, observing, and inferring. To me, this is what I believe testing is. It's uh, an abstract construct. It's a process. It's something that you do. It's not something that you have. So we all think about testing as being a test case or an artifact that lives in some test management tool. It's not those things. Those are the explicit um, representation of a process, a thing that we're doing, a thing that we're thinking about. So this is the uh, idea of testing that I think uh, applies. So every time I say testing, you think this. James Bach is also famous for putting things in a pithy uh, little way. And he says the testing is performance. I kind of like that definition because it fits in nicely with this particular presentation, talking about the correlation between testing and improv. So what about improv? It's just short for improvisation. Oxford gives us this definition, the process of creating and performing spontaneously without planning. Relatively straightforward, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what improv is. There's a good chance that most people in this room had some idea of what testing is, and now you have an idea what testing is from my perspective. But how many people here have ever been to an improv show, experienced improv? A lot of hands. Awesome. How many people here have done improv, been trained or performed it? Oh, a few people. Excellent. So for those of you that are not aware, improv is basically performers on stage but there's no props, there's no costumes, there's no script, there's no environment. They create something from nothing based on suggestions from the audience. 
That's what improvisation is, short form improvisation. Now, there's a lot of different forms of improvisation. I said short form, and I'm focusing on comedic today, but there's long form improv, there's improv dance, like interpretive, there's improv music, like jazz, improv singing, like scat. There's all sorts of different improv. There's improvisational theater. Today, I'm talking specifically about short form improvisational comedy, and that's going to be the form that I use as an analogy for testing. If you're still not quite sure what improv is, maybe you've seen the show. Whose line is it anyway? Familiar with that? Sure. That is a very popular show that has brought improv in its current short form comedic form into our living room. So that's how many people are familiar with improv. It also is very obviously a performance since it's right in the definition itself, creating and performing. So five minutes in and we've already found one correlation between testing and, and improv. They're both performances. Hopefully we find some more connections, otherwise this is going to go horribly awry. So hopefully we are out of shallow agreement. Now when I say testing, you understand the idea that I mean when I say that word. And when I say improv, you know what I mean when I say improv. And when I say triangle, you know that I mean a green isosceles, right? All right. So now we should uh, have some of our basic definitions down. Let's look back at the definition of improv. As I began to uh, research this particular presentation and think about different ways that improv might be related to testing, I, I started by dissecting the definition. So I looked at this definition and looked at each word and, and thought about and considered what it actually meant. Improv is the process, the, something you do of creating, making something, performing an action spontaneously, which is instantaneous, suddenly, without planning, without um, a lot of premeditation. And I thought, I took a year of classes in improv, and many, many people always ask me, if improv is supposed to be off the cuff, how do you take classes to learn that? Isn't it supposed to be just made up as you go? There's a book called Truth in Comedy. It's one of the, it's 30 years old. It's uh, written by a couple of the KG veterans of improvisational comedy. Uh, Del Close is one of them. And they say improvisation is making it up as you go along. So it definitely is just making things up as you go along. And I thought, is there anything special? Why did I take a year of classes to learn things that you can just make up? Is there anything special about improv that I can do after training that you cannot do? Is there anybody in here that cannot create and perform something spontaneously? Can everybody here do that? Some nods? No? Yes? Thumbs up. Can everybody here create and perform something without planning? Maybe? Let me put it this way. Truth in Comedy goes on to say that we're all expert improvisers. We go out of the house every single day, and although we may have a plan for how our day is going to unfold, very often that plan goes awry. Things happen, and what do you do? You improvise. You're on your morning commute, and you encounter an accident or construction, you have to improvise. You decide to go to a restaurant and the line's too long, so you go to a different restaurant for lunch. We improvise, all of us, every single day, and we've been doing so as children, since we were children. We're all experts at this. So I came to the conclusion that we are all expert improvisers. Based on that definition, based on some, uh, some guidance from this book, I, I de uh, deduced that we're all expert improvisers. I thought, is the same thing similar uh, for testing. So I looked at the testing definition. It's the process of evaluating a product by learning about it through experimentation. Can everybody here do that? Anybody that can't do that? How about uh, including to some degree questioning, studying, modeling? Can everybody question and study and model a product without training? Do you need special training to be able to model or uh, study a product? What about observing? Can everybody here observe a product? Inferring? Everybody here knows how to infer things, consciously or unconsciously. You infer things all the time. Is there anything special about testing that you need to have special training here? No. Testing is making it up as you go along, too. According to this definition, which is my working definition of testing, it's just making it up. Therefore, we're all expert testers as well. So another correlation. We are all, based on those two definitions, expert improvisers and testers. And I've cut out way too many slides. I didn't, uh, this is way too short, sorry. <laughs> no, of course not. This is not the end. This doesn't make any sense. We're all expert improvisers and testers. How can that be? Why did you take a year of training for improvisation? Why do people learn different test techniques? What is the catch here? So I thought about the uh, definitions again. And I looked back in the book, and, and one of the, uh, the nice quotes that they provide was, improvising on stage is obviously a little different. Ah, good. So on stage is different than just walking out your door in the morning and improvising. How so? The performers are trying to entertain an audience. To me, 
that seemed like a purpose, a reason, a reason that they're doing this improvisation performance. And I talked earlier about the importance of having reasons and purpose and answering the why. Why are you doing this thing? So I thought, if performers are doing improv for the reason to entertain an audience, I added that on to my definition to make it more robust. It's creating and performing spontaneously without planning in order to entertain an audience. It's not the reason. Other improvisers do it because it pays. I never got paid, but it sometimes pays. Some people do it because it's fun. Some people do it to train. Uh, some people, perhaps, in one weird situation, are forced to do improv. I don't know. But that's a, a, a primary reason of why people do improvisational comedy, to entertain an audience. So it got me thinking, what about testing? Why do people test? Uh, there's uh, Michael Bolton, not that one. Uh, the testing Michael Bolton says, testing supplies vital information about the product to those who must make decisions about it. I already gave you my definition of testing, but this is what Michael says the reason is. The main product of testing is information. That information can be given to different customers, different stakeholders to use as they see fit, and that may indirectly lead to higher quality. I may provide a lot of testing information after my testing process or testing performance, and they decide to ignore it. So maybe the quality does not increase. Maybe it doesn't get better. But what I've done is provided them information so they can make more informed decisions. James Bach, testers light the way, in his little pithy manner. He says that testers light the way of the software development effort by uh, evaluating the product through all those different things we talked about and providing information. So I thought about it, and the purpose, a purpose of testing might be to inform a customer. I also do it because it pays. I sometimes do it because it's fun. Sometimes I test because I want to learn something. But a main purpose of testing is to inform a customer, to give them information so they can be more informed about the decisions they have to make about the product and the quality. Everybody on board? Making sense? So I have these better, more robust definitions of improv and testing that include a purpose. So what? So who cares? So if you have a purpose, that means you have a target, something you're aiming at. I want to entertain an audience as an improviser. I want to inform a customer as a tester. If you have a purpose and you have a target, you can kind of inform them. You can really inform them. You can succeed or fail. And it's not binary. There's degrees of success and degrees of failure. So if I'm doing improvisation, I might really be entertaining to an audience. I might really fail to entertain them or a bunch of uh, uh, shades between. If I'm a tester, I might provide information that uh, informs the customer so they're uh, able to make great decisions, or I may not provide the information that they need, the information that they want, the helpful, useful information, so I may not really inform them. And at some degree of lesser and lesser success, it flips over and you might categorize that as a failure. So nobody wants to fail, and improvisers don't like to fail. So in improv, they have ways to reduce the uh, chances of failure. How do we do that? With rules. This is why I took a year of training. They teach you rules. OK, now, rules seems a little strict, so I'll use air quotes. They're air, you know, rules and air quotes. Another way to think about rules are rules of thumb. They're guidelines, heuristics, tips and tricks. That's right in the title of this presentation. I went to training for one year to learn all these different tips and tricks, ways to help reduce the chances of failure on stage tools in my tool belt that I can use in various situations that might help increase my chances of success. Um, again, Truth in Comedy says, following some simple basic rules may result in much funnier, intelligent, and more interesting scenes. So if you think about this, uh, uh, following the logic through rules can lead to funnier, intelligent, and more interesting scenes. I'm going to think that those are probably going to be more entertaining to an audience. And if it's more entertaining to an audience, since that's our target, you might say that could lead towards successful improv. Make sense? Does this flow make sense to everybody? So I wondered, if these rules that I learned in improvisation, and these rules, these tools in my tool belt that I use up on stage can help me be better at improvisation, could they also help me at testing? And that's what I intend to find out today. I'm going to do it by myself, and I'm going to ask for your participation. So start sinking down in your seat right now if you don't want to be called on or if you're not ready to come up on stage. But I am going to ask for volunteers, so start pumping yourself up. All right, so what kind of rules did I learn during this training? Oh, there you go. Rules leads to successful improvisation. Yes and. Has everybody, anybody ever heard of this rule? There's a few people here. There's a hand, a hand. If you know anything about improvisation behind the scenes, this is arguably the most important and well-known rule. Yes and. So what is yes and? What does it mean? In an improvisational context, it means accepting what others say on stage. So I'm up here with other performers. 
Whatever they say, maybe it seems completely reasonable and logical, I agree with it. But what if they say something that's completely out of left field, not what I was expecting at all? I agree with it. No matter what they say, I agree with it. I accept this information as being fact. We're helping build a reality for the audience. And I say, yes, that is absolutely true. But if that's all I did on stage, I'm not being a very good scene partner. If all I'm doing is saying, yes, 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 that's not adding a lot to the scene. So the other part of yes and is the and part. I'm adding information to the scene. So somebody might say, um, imagine that I'm a plumber on stage. And I say, well, ma'am, I, th I think I see the problem here. Uh, your, your sink's dripping here. I can't believe you didn't see it yourself, but it's dripping right there it is. So I, I'm going to need that uh, number 14 wrench over there. And if the scene partner says, no, nope, it's going to be tough for me to react to that. Uh, please, please give me the wrench. Nope. Well, all right, I'll get it myself. All right, this, this sure is a tough job. You've been putting anything funny down the sink? Nope. Uh, okay, I don't know what's going on. You can see how it might be a blockade to developing a scene. But what if I did the same scene and said, hey, can I have that wrench over there? And they said, yes, and it's not just any wrench, it's a brand new wrench. I went, oh, man, now I have something to work on. This is a brand new wrench. I'm accepting what they said. And I don't know if I want to get it dirty in all this water. And they say, well, and you don't want to get it dirty, but I'm paying you. And all of a sudden, the scene is evolving more naturally. It's a very easy concept to accept what someone said and bad, add on to it. It makes scenes evolve more naturally. Therefore, they'll be more interesting, hopefully more intelligent, more funny, which again leads to successful improv. Does this make sense? All right, some more nodding heads. Another neat thing about yes and is I'm on stage with other performers. And as you yes and, the spotlight focuses between them and myself, goes around stage and goes to different people as we all participate. So we're truly collaborating on stage. I'm saying a statement, the spotlight and the focus shifts to someone else. They have the focus, they accept the statement and add on to it, it shifts to someone else or perhaps back to me. So the spotlight is moving around stage. There's a saying in improv that the, the troupe, the ensemble is the star. No single person on stage is the star of a show. Everyone working together is the star. So, um, one thing I like to do in training, because people learn in different ways, some people learn by uh, hearing things, some people learn by seeing things, some people learn by doing things. I've just told you a lot about this improvisational concept. Now it's time to try it. Okay? Now is the time for volunteers. Who's going to be the first very brave volunteer to come up? Not everyone at once. Hey, we got a hand back there. All right. Big round of applause as he makes his way up to stage here. There's some steps on the uh, side over there. By the way, the back row, that's, that's the hand that went up. The back row. All right, there's going to be more opportunities, so everybody don't get too eager. You're, you're going to have your chance. Thank you very much. Joseph, yes. thank you for coming up. All right, have you ever done improv before? Uh, a couple times. A couple times. All right, a KG veteran we have here. All right, so. I'm only doing this to embarrass my students. Oh, fantastic. Are they embarrassed? Uh, it looks like you guys see somebody going like this. <laughs> All right. Excellent. This is a good reason to do improv. Another reason to do improv. Embarrass your students. All right. So we are going to try and demonstrate and exemplify the yes and concept in improvisation by doing a very short game. This is actually a game that sometimes improvisers will do during warm-up. It's called the three-line scene. Clearly, it has 19 lines. No, it has three lines in it. And all we're going to do is I'm going to start. I'm going to say a sentence. I'm going to pass it off to you. You're going to say yes, that sentence that I just said. And, and you're going to add on to it, and then pass the spotlight back to me, and I'll finish it up with the third line. Okay. Sound fair? Sounds fair. But to prove to everybody that this is truly improvisational, this is instantaneous and sudden and not pre-planned, pre we need a suggestion from the audience. So, how about, what is the worst thing you ever got for Christmas? Underwear. Underwear? I said the worst thing. <laughs> all right. Well, I have pretty bad Christmases. I like underwear, so. All right. It happened with my mother all the time. It did? All right. All right, Joseph, are you ready to do an improvisational scene? Three lines. I'm going to say a statement. You're going to yes and that statement and pass it right back about underwear. Okay. All right, you ready? Oh, Dad! Underwear! It's my favorite! Yes, it is your favorite. And here are your two front teeth. <laughs> yes, my two front teeth. 
and I needed those. <laughs> Scene. That's it. <laughs> Joseph, thank you very much. Wait, 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 Joseph. Not, not so fast. Thank you. I'm not, give it up for Joseph. Fantastic job. Don't forget to tip your waitress. Exactly. Try the veal. So wait, wait. You're not done yet. I want to ask you, how did that feel? Felt pretty good. Felt pretty good. Was it easier to uh, simply take something and accept it in and then add on to it rather Absolutely. than thinking up a brand new line? Yes. Okay. So this is kind of the idea behind Yes And. But you cannot be a professional improviser. You now have cut your teeth on improvisation, but you can't be a professional improviser without the tools of the trade. There is your jester wand, so now you can go and, f and easily mingle amongst uh, jesters worldwide. And you can't be a tester without a magnifying glass. So thank you very much. Brave first volunteer, Joseph. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, am I done now? You are finally done, yes. Thank you, Joseph. All right, so now you've, uh, you've seen how uh, Yes And actually works. I've told you the concept, and you have a better idea of what this uh, improv idea is all about. Next, I'm going to change contexts. Now it's time to see how Yes And might actually help you in a testing uh, context. So, as I said, testing is evaluating a product by questioning it, studying it, modeling it, inferring it, and various other things. In this case, my scene partner, when I'm testing, is the application, the product. So if I can think of one single test, one experiment to do against this particular product, and I can say, all right, for this, I want to try this action, and I interrogate the product, you know what it's going to do? It's going to respond in some way. And it responds, and I can say, ah, I accept this. Now I know something that I didn't know before. And I can think of another test to add on to that. And I execute that test. I explore, exercise the product, and it responds again. Oh, I've learned something new. And I'm going to accept that as the reality because I've seen it happen. And I'm going to add on to that. And you can see how this might snowball. If I can come up with one single idea, it can feed a second test and a third test and a fourth test and a fifth test. The yes and concept is very, very useful for helping testers come up with ideas on how to test their product. Another thing about yes and is the collaboration aspect. On stage, you're yes anding with other improvisers. You're passing the spotlight back and forth. How many people in here have ever done paired uh, development? Couple hands. Do people know what paired development is? Paired development is basically two developers sitting at one keyboard, one monitor, uh, interacting and creating an application at the same time. Two heads are better than one. They work uh, off of each other. They, they feed ideas to each other. Um, I'm suggesting pair testing as a technique for testing as well. Two testers interacting and experimenting on the same product at the same time. Now think about how the focus might change. If I can come up with one single idea, maybe I have a requirement or a specification, and I can think of one way to exercise that requirement, and the product speaks back to us, maybe the other tester says, oh, I accept that as real, I accept that, and I can think of another test idea. And they interact with the product. And we see it uh, react, and I say, oh, that just made me think of this new thing that we can try. So all of a sudden, off of a single requirement or single specification, between the two of us, we can come up with many, many ways to exercise that and get much deeper testing than I might have by myself or I may have without trying to use this technique. But I told you about yes and in an improv context, and then we showed you. Now I've just told you about yes and in a testing context. I would like to show you, see if it actually works. So, we're going to try and test something live here. We're going to test a little application called Notepad. Heard of it? I, it's hard to get hands here. All right. So if no one's heard of Notepad, I won't feel bad later when I ask, uh, has anybody done this? Uh, okay. So Notepad, uh, I began doing research into different aspects and features and functions of Notepad. I wanted to strip away a lot of the, um, the abstractions and a lot of the, uh, uh, the distractions of testing a more complex application. So I wanted to choose something very simple in order to demonstrate these ideas. So in Notepad, the first test I want to do uh, today, I've been asked to test uh, scrolling a Notepad document. So I have some sample text files here. I found out that at 1024 characters, Notepad with word wrap off will automatically uh, loop to the next line. So I just made a big 1024 by 1024 block of text just to have something to play with in Notepad. Uh, I actually have a second version here that has the, pre the lines prepended here, so I can kind of tell where I am in the document. So today I've been asked to um, navigate a Notepad document. Damien, can you test it? So I think, all right, well, there's a lot of different ways to navigate. I can use the scroll button on my mouse. I can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. I can use the thumb over here, and I can grab it and move it. I can use the uh, scroll bar buttons. There's a lot of different ways. What about page up and page down? So today I'm going to try 
and navigate and test navigation of a notepad document using page up and page down. So I can think of at least one way to test this, and that's hitting the page down button. So I'm going to hit page down. Here's my uh, line number and column num number down here. I'm going to hit page down and see what happens. I was on line one, now I'm on line 20. So I have a working hypothesis now. I don't have, I looked online, I could not find requirements or specifications for Notepad, bizarrely. It's everywhere, but you can't find how it's actually, what's, what is page down supposed to do? If I asked you, would you say 20 lines? I have a working hypothesis that page down goes 20 lines. So I'm on line 20 now, my cursor's there. What if I hit page down again? What should this uh, number read right here? Anybody? 40. 40. All right, we got a 40. Let's try it. Can you read that? 39. It says 39. So earlier I had a hypothesis that when I hit page down it goes 20, but now it, it only went 19. So what is my new working hypothesis here? Say again? Start with one. Start with one. Oh, so it's one. Uh-huh. Okay, so let's try that. I'm going to go back to 1, hit page down to 20, hit page down again to 39. If I hit page down again, what should the number be? 58? 58. All right, new working hypothesis. It goes uh, 19 lines every time you hit page down. Is that reasonable or anybody disagree with that? What? Does it redisplay the last line? What do you mean by that? Okay, let's try it. I'm going to hit page down. Line 20 is the top line. So the bottom line previously is now the top line. If I hit page down right now, 39 should be top. Is that your new hypothesis? And it is. All right, cool. So I'm learning something. Every, does everybody agree that when you hit page down, it advances 19 rows? Unless you resize the window. Oh. Who said that? Raise your hand. Unless I resize the window. All right, let's try that. I'll resize it to, how about display 10? All right, now I'm going to hit page down. What's your new hypothesis here? 10. Now, wait a second. We were on line 1. Now it says line 10. What have we learned? How much does page down actually advance? Speak up. One page. So let's try a, a new test here. What if I resize this to only show five rows? What's my hypothesis? Nine of lines minus one. Let's try that. Five. And if I do it again, nine. If I do it again, 13. Ah, okay. So I'm learning something about uh, uh, what page down, how it actually functions. First, I thought it just goes down 20 rows, and then I realized it wasn't 20. It was actually 19. Then it's not 19. It's actually the number of rows visible minus one. So I just thought of a test I'd like to do. What's going to happen if I hit page down now? Our hypothesis is the number of rows minus one. Any, any guesses? Nothing. Nothing, no change. Somebody said one row. All right, page down, ready? Two, three, four, five. So now page down is the number of rows visible minus one unless there's only one row showing. Right? You following? So I'm learning things about the application just by interacting with it. Oh, now what? Any guesses? Will it expand to show one row, like this? So let's make sure our cursor's on line one, two, three, four, five. I'm curious what will happen if I put my cursor on line one and I show zero rows. Any guesses? OK, let's try it. It's still, I have to move the mouse because there seems to be a paint issue here. I have to move, I just hit page down three times, and if I move my mouse, it will repaint. So it seems to me that there's a new hypothesis that we've come to. Page down will move the number of rows on screen minus one unless there's one or zero rows shown, in which case it will move one row. And if there's zero rows shown, there will be a paint issue. <laughs> we got to this point by yes anding, and I didn't do it by myself. I did it with your help. We started with one test idea. What if I hit page down? And the application responded in such a way that I was able to come up with a second experiment and a third, and with your help, come up with fourth, fifth, sixth hypotheses, new experiments to try. So this hopefully 
is a way that I demonstrated how yes and might actually be a way to uh, generate test ideas and help you with your testing. Thumbs up, down, making sense? All right, I see some thumbs up. I didn't see any thumbs down and nobody's throwing fruit or vegetables at me so far, so let's move on. The next, uh, the next topic I'd like to talk about is listening. I actually went to class for a year and they taught me all these different improvisational tips and tricks and how to reduce the chances of failing on stage. And one of the things they taught me was to listen. And you're probably thinking, I wasted my money and you're wasting your time and I should get off stage. But hey, settle down, settle down. Listening is actually very, very important and it's not easy to do. Why is listening and improv not easy to do? Because you're on stage, you want to be interesting and funny and intelligent because you know that that will lead to an entertaining audience and an entertained audience is successful improv. You want to succeed. So what's the big deal? Just listen. But you're on stage and you're embodying this plumber and you want to think, what is the funniest thing that a plumber would say in this situation? What would a real plumber say? Maybe it doesn't have to be funny. What did I just say? Does it have to be? That's not listening. That's focused on yourself and your own thoughts. In improvisation, listening is another way to say defocus. It's another way to be in the moment. And being in improv is being in the moment, the here and now. It's almost like getting out of your head, being hyper aware. And listening doesn't just mean the words that you're listening to. It also means body language and tone and facial, uh, uh, facial features. If somebody says, uh, hey, man, I really missed you, it might mean something very different if it's two college roommates talking to each other or a sniper talking to his target. And if I'm not listening, if I'm in my head thinking, how should I respond? What should I say? How can I entertain the audience? I'm not listening. If you're not listening, you can't follow that first rule of improv, which is yes anding. So listening is very, very important. It's a method of defocusing. Who wants to come up here and help me try and show listening? This is a fun one. Somebody getting up already? Oh, you're going the wrong way, completely the wrong way. All right, can I get an, uh, another volunteer to come up and help me show what? All right, we got somebody. Another round of applause, please. <laughs> Do we need a, a grappling hook to get you up here? All right. Your name? Scott. Scott, yes, all right, Scott. Another round of applause for Scott. This is uh, tough to get up here. Thank you very much. All right, Scott. We're going to try and uh, exemplify the listening idea in improv uh, with a little game called After Ever After. So many of us, uh, either as a child or to our own children, have read fairy tales and children's books and parables. And very often they end with, and they lived happily ever after. This is going to tell what happened after Ever After in one of these famous stories. So. What I need first is a famous story, a famous children's story, like Goldilocks or the Three Pigs or something like that. Cinderella. Cinderella. All right. So for the people that are not familiar with Cinderella or how the story ends, how does Cinderella end? What? They get, married. they get married. So Cinderella and the prince get married and they live happily ever after. Okay, so we're going to explain to people what happened after Cinderella and the prince get married and live happily ever after. But there's a catch. We're going to do it one word at a time. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All you have to do is provide the next word in the sentence, and we're going to tell everyone exactly what happens after ever after with Cinderella. Are you ready, Scott? Yeah. All right. Cinderella had many pairs of glass eyeglasses to wear at the ball gowned <laughs> too many times she <laughs> couldn't fit <laughs> the gowns for the Exceptional. Princes. And scene. That's it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Now, wait a second, Scott. I do have one question. How did it feel to do that game? You kept stealing the thunder. <laughs> I stole the thunder. So you, you wanted to say something, but I, I prevented it with my word, right? Okay. How did it feel to listen and be able to react like that? It was different. Yeah. 
It's very, very difficult. This is why you take training and, and practice and practice and practice. One of the reasons I dropped out of improv again was because I couldn't attend practices doing things like learning how to listen and react instead of getting in your head and thinking the next word in this sentence should be this or the funniest word in this sentence should be this. It's very difficult, but you did fantastic. And now the rest of the crowd knows why the story ends where it did because it gets very uninteresting and actually kind of confusing after that. <laughs> so thank you, Scott. Big round of applause. Yeah. I was going to say, it, it, sh the story ends and then she uh, broke her glass slipper and cut her foot and then the prince didn't want to be with her anymore. And that's so sad. Yeah, nobody wants a sad Cinderella story. But thank you very much, Scott. Another round of applause. I am very, very impressed with the volunteers to get up here because it's, uh, this is a safe space. Believe it or not, it may be terrifying to you. This is a very safe environment and everyone here wants to see you succeed. Um, improv is a lot of fun. Believe it or not, when I get up to do presentations, if I reframe them as improvisational performances, all the butterflies go away. I'd rather do improv than present. So, anyway, now you have a better idea of how uh, listening works and what it means, and you've actually seen a demonstration of it. How might listening work in a testing context? Uh, 20 minutes left? 20 minutes. All right, we're going to go fast here. Uh, when you're testing, Sometimes you're given a feature or a specification and you are absolutely focused on that. You want to do the best job you can, you want to inform your customer, so you're focused on that thing. Sometimes that focus can actually be detrimental. Not always. Again, these are tips and tricks, guidelines. Sometimes they work in certain contexts, certain situations, sometimes they don't. It's something to try. Defocusing when you're testing can actually sometimes help you see things that you might have missed before. Um, Chris, I think, was talking earlier, I, I attended your session, fantastic, about patterns. Sometimes when you're defocused, you can actually notice something that you missed before, and then a little bit later you'll notice another small thing and another small thing, and those equal up to a pattern, and that may uh, signify a symptom of some larger problem that you may have completely missed if you were absolutely focused on the thing that you were uh, testing. So sometimes it helps to step back almost literally blur your eyes. There's a thing called the blink test. It's one approach of testing where you're looking at things to see if uh, pixels change on screen, if there's any changes visually. Sometimes it helps to see the forest instead of the trees. Uh, I intend to show that to you. So, let's take a look and see if we can uh, um, uh, exemplify listening in a testing context. So I'm going to create a, uh, oh sorry, Adventures of Sherlock Holmes here. I'm going to test today saving a document. So um, I'm going to do it, there's a lot of different ways to save a document. I'm going to use control S. Every time I'm going to hit control S. So uh, first off, I'm going to make a change to the document and I'm going to hit control S. And uh, it looks like it worked. I'm not really sure. I can look at the date and time stamp. That seems to make sense to me. 414, that's the date. 1159, that's the time. So it seems to me that my first test has worked. Um, can anybody think of another test to try with Control S and saving a document? Don't make a change. So just do Control S again. Let me try. OK. I think it worked. Uh, not enough time has passed for the timestamp to change. I think that that's probably a reasonable test. Uh, we'll come back to that as, as the, the clock ticks here, but any other, any other ideas of what I could do? Delete something. All right, I'm going to delete this entire word here. Hit delete. I'm going to hit control S. Is anybody noticing anything as I save? I mean, it appeared to work. Nothing weird happened, right? I'll, I'll delete another word. I'm going to delete this word, and I'm going to hit Control S. Notice anything? Okay, it's not asking me. That might be something. Let me add a bunch of text in here. I'm going to hit Control S. Now I want everybody in here to defocus. Defocus. See if anything changes. Line number and column number changed. Line one, column one. My, co my cursor doesn't look like it's on line one, column one. All right, let's try that. I'm going to place my cursor right here on line nine, column 20. I'm going to hit backspace, line nine, column 19. I'm going to hit control S. Line one, column one. That's interesting. Now, I did the saving activity several times, but it wasn't until the defocusing, and I'm hoping the defocusing actually helped you notice this change on screen. When I was actually experimenting around and seeing if defocusing was an, a, a good test technique, which I happen to know it is, but it's also an improv technique. 
This is one of the things I discovered about saving that I had missed before. I was so concentrated on date and time stamps and are the, are the changes that I made to the document actually preserved, the ads, the edits, deletes. I hadn't thought about other things that I might be missing. So by defocusing and hitting Control S, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I went, what's that? I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it sure is interesting. So hopefully this uh, kind of demonstrates the listening concept for you. All right, moving on. We're going to pick up the pace here. No driving. An improvisation driving is basically taking a scene and going where you want it to go. Um, there's a lot of different ways uh, to do driving and improvisation. One is endowment, uh, giving other actors on stage uh, physical or verbal characteristics, like saying, hey, this is my brother. Too bad he stutters. Now, if they're yes-anding, they have to, to stutter for the rest of the show. Or if I say, you know, oh, this is my boss, my one-legged boss, and they have to do this for the rest of the thing if they're yes-anding. So that's one way that I am controlling the scene. Now, sometimes, as these tools are, are, you can break these rules, these air quote rules, for comedic effect. But generally, you don't want to drive a scene because you are using your preconceived notions, your assumptions about the reality, and you're forcing them on everyone else. Another way of demonstrating this in improv is asking questions that you already know the answer to. I might say in a scene, hey, what is that? Oh my gosh, pick that up, bring it here. And my scene partner doesn't know what it is, so they bend down and they say, oh, it's bowling ball? And I, no, 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 it's a lottery ticket, we're going to be rich. If I already knew it was a lottery ticket, I should have just said, pick up the lottery ticket, instead of forcing him and controlling the scene and driving the scene with my preconceived notions. We're short on time, so I'm going to skip over the uh, audience participation. Big collective sigh of relief. Whew. All right. So what I'm going to do is jump directly into how this uh, idea, this concept might apply in testing. When you're driving a scene in improvisation, you have assumptions, preconceived notions. Another way to think about these are biases, cognitive biases. There's lots and lots and lots of ways that our thinking can be affected without knowing it. And that's very dangerous uh, in testing, especially when you're trying to provide information to a customer. Now, cognitive biases are notoriously difficult to eliminate, but if you're aware of them, then you can help manage them. Be aware that you might be influenced by this certain thing. Experimenter's bias is a fantastic one, especially for a tester. If you have a requirement that says this is what it should do, and you do this thing, then and it matches what the requirement says, that makes sense. But what if you have a vague requirement or no requirement, and you have a gut feeling of how this thing should probably work? and you interact with the application, it responds, and you go, yeah, that seems right to me. For whatever reason, you say, yeah, that seems right. And then you release the product, you don't provide your customer that information, the product goes out in the wild, and customers start complaining about this thing, and they say, what's up with this? Why didn't you find that? And you go, oh, I, I did, I just thought it was right. I didn't ask questions. I, I didn't realize that some of my biases were influencing what I was able to report. So I will demonstrate this idea. Uh, this is actually kind of a neat one. All right, I'm going to create a new text document here. New text document seems like a good name for a new text document. I'm going to type first line space. I'm telling you exactly everything I'm doing. I'm going to select with my mouse that first line. I'm now going to type second line space. I'm going to put the cursor at the beginning of the document, line one, column one. I'm going to type third line space. Now, does everybody in here know the idea of undo in Notepad? What does undo do? It undoes. Yes, of course, it undoes. So, uh, undo, undo, I can use the uh, menu right here. I can hit Control Z is undo. What if I hit undo right now? What will happen? Say again? So, it should undo... Second to last change. Okay, any other takers? Any other? Okay, there it is. That's what undo does. It completely... Oh. Yeah, the secret, secret feature in Notepad. I don't know if you knew that. All right, any other takers? Any other guesses about what undo might do? Undo the undo? Anybody think it'll get rid of the space? Okay, anybody think it'll get rid of the entire third line and the space? No? What? Just the space. space. Alright, let's just uh, let's get you off the edge of the cliff here. I'm going to hit Control Z. Ready? It says first line, second line. So in this case what it did was not just get rid of the entire third line that I, that I uh, typed, but it replaced it with something that 
somehow is in my buffer. I didn't even put that in the clipboard. I did not copy control, control C or control Z that, but somehow it replaced that. Did anybody here expect that to happen? Now, what if you thought that that was correct behavior? What if you thought, yeah, that seems reasonable. Let's go on to next test. That might, you might be influenced by your gut, by your different cognitive biases to avoid uh, reporting something that maybe is notable. So when you're testing, it's important to uh, provide information even if you don't know if it's correct behavior or incorrect behavior, it might be helpful to uh, report information that's interesting and let somebody else, your customer, be informed and say, thanks for reporting that. Turns out it's not a big problem. The customer doesn't care. Or, whew, I'm glad you told us about that because otherwise it would have gone out with this big error in it. So this is an example of uh, not allowing yourself to be driven while uh, test reporting. Oh, it got huge. All right. My resolution changed. I don't think it matters. Focus on relationships, the next one. Um, in improvisation, if you find yourself in a kitchen or in, a, in a, um, a living room or on a deserted island with your fellow performers based on audience suggestions, it's not as interesting to the crowd if you're making it about the deserted island or about the living room. It's more interesting to the audience and therefore entertaining and therefore successful improv if it's about the relationship between the two actors. So sometimes if you're on a, on a a desert island and you might be a married couple and it says, oh wow, this coconut, like, do you want it? No, I want it and, and let's split the coconut. That's not as interesting as if I say, wow, let's split the coconut. You know, you never split things at home. You always give them to, you know, making it about the relationship is more interesting to the people because they're there to see actors interact with each other, not interact with the environment. So as an improviser, sometimes a trick to do is just in the middle of a scene, if you find it's going nowhere, just say to the other actor or the other actors on stage, I love you. That will instantly up the stakes, make it about the love, the relationship between those two people. Maybe it's a husband and wife, maybe it's a boss and employee, and all of a sudden, you love me. I thought you'd never say it because I love you too. It's not about the water cooler anymore. It's about our relationship, and that's far more interesting to the audience. Again, we'll skip over the demonstration, but talk about how focusing on a relationship might be helpful in a testing context. When you're testing an application, as a tester, you're supposed to be objective, right? Well, what about subjective? As a tester, I'm trying to inform different uh, customers, different stakeholders. And there's a lot of different ones, and each person is different. Uh, Michael Bolton, uh, first off, uh, uh, a definition of quality that I particularly like comes from Jerry Weinberg, and he says, quality is value to somebody. And Michael Bolton has extended on that and said, somebody at some time. And really that idea about quality being value to some person at some time can be extended to many different abstract constructs, like humor. I may find a joke very, very funny, but you may not. The joke is the same, but we've just changed the person in the equation. Or something that was funny to me as a child may not be funny to me as an adult. Time has changed. So quality is value to somebody at some time. Who's the somebody and what is the time? As a it's a relationship between a person and a thing. Same thing with pain, same thing with courage, same thing with defects. I always say the best way to solve a defect is ask someone that doesn't care. Say, I found the most important bug and I tell the project manager, and they say, we've got to get it fixed, and I tell the stakeholders, and they say, oh, this is so important, and I tell my kids at home, and they're like, I don't care. It's not a bug to them. So if you change the relationship between the entity and the, 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 the person and the thing that you're evaluating, it changes uh, your perspective of it. So this is why it's important for testers to focus on the relationship. I want to give you a demonstration of this. Um, so I've got my big text file here, my big 1024 by 1024. I'm going to make a copy of it. I'm going to open it up. And when I was doing uh, different tests in preparation for this uh, presentation, I was deleting text and adding text and just generally goofing around. One of the features in Notepad is um, replace. So I was messing with replace, and I replaced all the number sevens with the number x, replace all. And I didn't see anything interesting there. And I closed down my document and I saved it. I thought, oh, maybe I'll try a different thing. And I came back the next day and I opened up my document and it looked like that. Those are Chinese characters. And I, what is that? What happened there? So I started to research and I found out that this is actually a known bug or, or known behavior in Notepad. Some people call it the moji bake. And what happens is a certain type of character sequence is read into a, a function, I believe it's called is text Unicode, and it reads in a certain uh, uh, number of characters at the beginning of a text pad document or beginning of an ASCII file, and it tries to determine what character set it is. 
this particular se sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, X, 8, 9, so for some reason it, it determines is UTF-16 uh, LE, which is Chinese characters, and it says, oh, you're trying to open up a Chinese character document, let me present it in the appropriate way. Ah, I've learned something cool that I didn't know before. That's hilarious. Until I realized that there's no way to undo this. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, I went from a guy presenting, you know, preparing a presentation to an aggravated user. I had to go and create this huge chunk of text again, and that's why I made a copy of it right now so I don't lose it. But all of a sudden, the relationship, the bug didn't change. My relationship to the bug changed. And all of a sudden, I realized that what I might have classified as a minor bug before, all of a sudden became a severe or, or high priority bug because it really bothered me. It really caused me grief. So this is a way that you might think uh, uh, about the relationship when you're testing. Uh, last two ideas, performance ideas. Uh, for the different uh, demonstrations we've had, I asked for audience ideas, but that's just one way that improvisers get uh, ideas. Another way is from past performances. Sometimes a previous skit or a previous game will generate ideas that you'll see people doing in future games. Sometimes they call that a callback in comedy. Another way is we'll ask people to pull out their wallet or their purse and, and, and pull a random item out and we'll do an entire scene based on that item. Sometimes we bring a book up or a phone book and we'll flip through and say stop or the yellow pages and tell us uh, one word off this page or whatever. There's a lot of different ways that performers come up with ideas. This same idea in testing uh, can be used to influence your testing performance. So you're given a requirement. And that's definitely a great way to start thinking about ideas. But what if the requirement is vague, or what if you don't have requirements? Where are you supposed to come up with these ideas? Well, you might ask the audience, just like an improviser does. Maybe you'll go to developers and say, hey, is there any areas of the application, if you were testing, you'd suggest me to go look there? Maybe it's a weak area or an area that's a little unstable. You might talk to the project managers. Say, hey, what do you suggest? If you're lucky enough, you can talk directly with the stakeholders and the customers of your product and say, hey, what's important to you? Whatever is important to you is going to be important to me. I want to go and investigate that uh, more deeply. Uh, another way is other forms of documentation. You don't have requirements, you don't have specifications. Maybe you have wireframes or different models of the product. Maybe you have database schema uh, architecture diagrams that you can look at, and that might inspire you of things to do in your testing performance. Um, maybe you have help, help files or other forms of documentation, user guides. Those are all ways that testers can go and generate ideas for their performance. And if you can come up with one idea, you can use the yes and or perhaps pair testing and come up with lots and lots of ways to exercise the product and get information. Last one, contemplate death. Uh, contemplate death. What I mean by this is after an improv show, they're always the same. The improvisers gather around with a pint of beer and they talk about the show. What went right, what went wrong. Wasn't it weird? I said this thing and I really thought it would get a laugh and I got nothing. And another part, I said this thing, it was completely mundane and the audience blew up. They loved it. So you talk about the show, and not only what went right or what went wrong, but why those things went right and why those things went wrong. Also, about con that's the uh, contemplate part. Think about it. The death part is there's two phrases in comedy, improv and other comedy, which is killing on stage. Anybody know what that means? Doing well. And there's another phrase, dying on stage. Not so well. Exactly the opposite, right? Killing and dying on stage, very morbid. So, when you're talking about a show, you can kind of determine whether you killed on stage or died on stage. But the only way to truly know is to climb into the uh, audience's head. And you can't do that, so you have indicators. Indicators might be applause. That might be one way of knowing if you killed on stage. Boos might be a way of knowing if you died on stage. Sometimes people checking their phone or talking in the back. That might be a way to know that you're not exactly entertaining that audience. You have your target, you're trying to hit it in the middle, you're using all your tools and your tool belt, all your guidelines and heuristics, and you still were unable to entertain that audience. So there's indicators that might tell you if you're succeeding or not so, not so much succeeding at improv, and then you can think about that by contemplating it afterwards. Does this sound familiar in the IT world or software development world? Retrospectives, lessons learned, or to build on this, um, uh, post-mortems. There's another death analogy there. After you're done with your particular testing performance, it might help to go with other testers or other stakeholders, other team members, and talk about what went well, what didn't go well. Again, this is nothing revolutionary, nothing new. It's just presented in a novel way, which hopefully reminds you how terribly important this activity of thinking about your performance is. And similar to contemplating death is how do you recognize if you did not inform that customer? 
Sometimes my customer is a developer as I submit a bug. Sometimes my customer is an actual end user, a real customer. The only way to know if they're truly informed is to climb in their heads, and I can't do that, so there's other indicators. People coming to me and saying, hey, that bug report didn't have nearly enough information. Can you, sh can you reproduce it for me? Ugh. Next time, I have to make sure to give this person, this customer, more information so that there's not churn. Or what about a customer that says, man, I know that you could have tested deeper and longer and better, but you provided information that allowed me to make a more informed decision than I could beforehand. So thank you very much. I know I've informed that customer, and I can adjust my reports to them accordingly. So there's different indicators that might tell you your degrees of success, and thinking about them after performance is terribly important. Don't forget to do it. We're at the end. This is the summary. Don't forget the different uh, improvisation tips and tricks, yes and. Take information in, agree with it, and then add on to it. It's a great way to generate test ideas and to collaborate with other testers. Listen, sometimes defocusing can actually be a very effective way of testing the feature or function that you're, uh, you're looking at. No driving. Remember to be aware of and try and manage your cognitive biases, your preconceived notions that may affect and influence the way that you uh, report your results to your customers. Focus on the relationship. Remember that quality and bugs are not, uh, are not concrete things. They're abstract relationships between somebody at some time. If you can uh, keep that in mind, it might help you uh, realize what types of things to report. Uh, you can't see it. It's off the screen. Performance ideas. Remember that there's more than just requirements and specifications. There's lots and lots of different ways to come up with test ideas. And finally, contemplate death. Uh, don't forget to think about your testing performance at the end and think about how close to the target you came to uh, succeeding or not succeeding. That's all I have for you today. I'm sorry I had to go so darn quickly, but I appreciate the volunteers and your interaction. Um, don't forget the testing is a performance, and that's all I got. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dale. Is our representation of uh, our appreciation for your work today. We have a gift from our board from Elrita, an iPad mini. I appreciate so thank it. You thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elrita. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.